hear is singer-songwriter, broadcaster, audio-video artist, entertainment agent and your host for the Dharmic Evolution. It's the master storyteller himself, James Kevin O'Connor. And welcome back once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Dharmic Evolution. Great to have you guys here with me today. We are in the northeast of the United States today. Uh, we took a little break from our globe trotting, and uh, we're visiting with a band in New York City. I love this. New York is is where it's at. And we're going to visit uh, a band called Heathcote Hill. It was forged by producer and songwriter Tom Nelson. He's the former lead guitarist for a New York City rock band, Sway. They got br- uh, eight brand new original songs, plus a cover of Crowded House uh, on their new record, we're going to celebrate everlasting today. So you better strap up your seatbelts because we're going for a ride. Are you a singer songwriter, author, speaker, or thought leader? Have you been looking for a platform for your career? Well, the James O'Connor Agency has exactly what you are looking for. Find out how we write and produce big, amazing songs on Music Row. For authors, speakers, thought leaders, and organizations like nonprofit and corporations. We also help singer songwriters and artists by giving them a platform on Dharmic Evolution, a podcast designed specifically to broadcast your global career, now in 71 countries and with more than 161 episodes of artists all over the world from all genres. We know how to reach your target audience. Are you a dreamer like James? Then reach out today to James at the jamesoconnoragency.com and find out how we can help your global career. Tom, welcome to the Dharmic Evolution. Hey, thank you for having us. Yeah, great to great to have you and uh, also representing Heath Coat Hill, the band with their new album out. Really great music. I was checking it out last night and this morning and uh, congratulations on this release. Uh, thank you. We're thrilled to have the record out, and um, we're really proud of it. Yeah, awesome. Um, you know, it's uh, a lot of really great things, and, you know, the vocalist starting with Megan, um, you know, just listening to the to the music and listening to her voice and the way you guys put it together, the arrangements, everything. How did this band um, take off? How did you guys, what was the springboard for this whole thing to, to like, come together? Uh, we had all known each other as musicians around town and played in bands together in the past. And I started writing a group of songs, and I asked a group of folks to help me record them, and I asked Megan to sing them because I think she's such a fantastic singer. Wow, awesome! It started as a project to record ten songs. Yeah, so so it was kind of like we didn't have a grand master plan. We're just going to make the record, and and then just out of that came came a band. Is that kind of the way it went? Kind of was it's to see if I had any. Um, it was a personal test to see if I had any skill as a song- songwriter. I just wanted to give it a try and see what happened. Yeah, and friends were so helpful, and it just became a labor of love. And and uh, people like the songs and they like the music, so that's been great. Yeah, that and and congratulations on uh, you're getting some. Uh some airplay too from this and that's really always you know the most happening thing when you can get airplay that's just fantastic so um everlasting that's the one um i mean you were um in a band called sway also but everlasting is that that's the one that's also on this record correct that's right everlasting is the is the title of our record and it's one of the uh nine songs on the record Fabulous, fabulous. Hey, uh, Tom, were you like um, born and bred New York City or like you or New York State? Like, where are you from? Where are your roots from originally? I was born in Detroit um, and uh, got into advertising. I lived in Chicago, New York, Toronto, and back to New York. Yeah, New York kind of just, you know, it's like it's got that pull, right? <laughs> well, for advertising, it does. And then it's just, it is the most amazing city in the world, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll have a, a lot of agreement from me on that too. It's, uh, you know, every time I go there, it's just, it's always like the first time. Every time. <laughs> One of the funniest things is Heathcote Hill. I live on is named for a guy named Caleb Heathcote, who was the first mayor, was a mayor in early New York in the 1700s. Oh, he lived up here, and he was the mayor in the city. 
I was going to ask you about that, where it came from. Now we know. So, so is there, um, so that, that, that's actually a place. Where is that, Heathcote Hill? Uh, uh, Mamaroneck is a town about 20 miles north of um, New York. And uh, Caleb Heathcote came here in the early 1700s and built an estate and owned a big chunk of property up here and became a powerful guy and a, a mayor of New York. Wow, the way things happen, huh? Hey, so uh, why don't we give everybody a taste and uh, let them know what Heathcote is all about. Here we go with some things in life.
right, all right. That is Some Things in Life. Man, good, good song. What a great sound. You guys got like a little bit of little bit of everything happening there, like that beautiful Petty style guitars and everything. It's just great rock, man. So how did you come up with your sound? Um, it was kind of building everything around Megan's voice, to tell you the truth. I, you know, come up with some words and some chords and we started to work it out with Megan and kind of built everything around it. And a lot of my friends were surprised that our first record was not what they expected. It was kind of, these are our ingredients. Tori was our drummer, Bruce was our bass player, Megan was our singer, and I played guitars, and that's how it all became something. Nice. Um, it's just, no one can say what our genre is, though. What genre do you think we are? I don't know. I don't know. I have enough trouble with my own stuff with that. It's like, you know, people are giving me all kinds of ideas, and, and I'm always like, nah, that's not it. I, I don't know. I, I think you guys are, you know, like, you know, pure, great, cla- I don't say classic rock, but just good rock. It's timeless rock. I guess you'd call it that. Um, because it's good no matter when you put it on. You know, it doesn't have to. And I like music like that. You know, take, for example, somebody like Petty or Van Morrison or something. You're going to get that same organic quality every time. And, you know, who cares what the, you know, the lineup of the instrumentation is? If that's what that's what works for you guys, then then that's your sound, you know? Yeah, and I think you, I, we wanted it to be to who, who we are, not not a, we weren't trying to be this. We're just trying to be us and I think that was kind of a nice thing left room for everybody to be who they are yeah did you have like a pivotal moment Tom when you guys were like you know you're getting into it maybe doing some rehearsals or you're laying these things down when everything just kind of clicked and you said oh man this is uh this is a unique sound I think we're I think we're on to something was there a, a moment that you recall that that happened um for me, as the trying to be a songwriter person, the first time I heard uh, Megan and Tori and Bruce and I play a song, and it became something outside my head and something, and I, I go, that's actually really interesting. It wasn't what I expected. It was its own thing, and I thought that's really neat to go from heard only here to heard there. It was just every time it's a surprise. It's a, the old voyeur perspective, you know. You step outside of yourself, and and you have a whole new level of of appreciation for the music, you know, which is always very cool. How do you experience it? I mean, when other pe- people play your stuff, it's such a compliment, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, and it's um, it's always for me. It's always a surprise. I record in Nashville, and I've been I've been working with the pretty much the same team for the last four years. And um, they're session players. However, it feels like a family now, you know, and it's like and I always I I always go in with no preconceived notions of exactly the way it'll sound. I mean, I always know I'm in the the rock camp or whatever, but each song I feel has its own path. And I'm a big believer in just follow what the song teaches you to do and don't don't try to manipulate too much. Just ride with it and just go with it, you know. And um, with that in mind, it's it's like I'm never disappointed. You know? Well, I think people ask me if, how my if my songs are personal or documentaries or portraits or what. And I go, every song is its own thing. It starts, it becomes its own thing like a child the minute it leaves you. And you kind of just have to follow your song and find out what it's trying to be. I know that sounds dumb. Yeah. But it, it, it's its own thing and it has to be babied and brought to life yeah hey when did you um discover that you had songwriting in your blood um i was a writer and director and advertising was my career and so i've always been in a creative community and worked with some great directors and great actors and great musicians and it was a really talented group of it was a really fun world to be in and then I got back into music later in life and found a lot of the same creative challenges. So I wanted to see if I could go from commercial writing to songwriting and see. And you did it rather well. It's been fun. A lot of the same challenges of how to how to say something that you think is unique and then look at it on a page and go, is that really unique? And how do I make it more me and less someone else? I don't know. The process of squeezing out the invitation. 
Right. When you yeah. um when you're in your writing process, Tom, do you um rough the songs out first and bring it into to your band or you know, is it completely done? Do you have ideas for other instrumentation or do you just kind of lay it out and say, um, you know, this, here's a chord structure and the melody and, and uh, let's see what we come up with. Like, what is your process? We've done it all kinds of different ways. Bringing songs, for me, I try to have a, at least a complete sketch of a, here's a verse, a second verse, a bridge and out, and I think it should be like this. And, uh, so, so people aren't confused or searching. And then we can play with it from there. Other times, it's been something I've played for Megan, and we've thought to do it this way. Some other things where somebody's brought a song into the band, and we've turned it around. Uh, uh, it, it can happen anyway. I think it's once it starts to exist, it can come from anywhere. It can come in a, any different door. But what do you do with it? How do you treat it once it arrives? And the folks... I'm working with, they're great. They're like, they're encouraging. Hey, that's cool. What can we do with it? I, I think our thing is let's give it a try before we say no. A lot of people say no before they give it a try. Yeah. We're trying to try that. Yes. So does, does Megan, I, I see Megan has four young kids. So does she bring them to rehearsal? <laughs> uh, she's brought them to the studio. Um, I had and, a feeling. Uh, yeah, but no, the, I, it's just part of her life. You know, mom's got practice tonight. Yeah. So once a week, that's her thing. Yeah. Was, I, just, I, I think it's great when you, uh, when you expose the young kids to, uh, you know, to music at an early age because so many of them just get that experience and say, wow, this is something I need to be involved in, you know, and it's just, it's just nice to see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so her two daughters are on our first record, though, which is nice. They're are the, they really? They're in the chorus of Love Will Only Wreck Your Life. Oh, is, that's awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Hey, let's do another one, Tom. This one, speaking of all night, this is Rain All Night. Hush, man, darling, now don't you cry. My home is gonna sing you a lullaby And don't you worry, it'll be alright You wouldn't be driving on a rainy night The storm can howl and the wind can blow Nobody tells where to go Hold my hand, honey, hold it tight You and me driving on a rainy night It's alright It'll rain all night Rain all night Weaving in between the lines Headlights flashing in the highway shines You would be driving on a rainy night It's alright It'll rain all night Rain all night Tell the truth, so we got a lie. 
Yeah, people always want to know the reason why You would be driving on a rainy night You and me together on a rainy night You and me forever on a rainy night Hearts get broken every single day Oh, what fools our mamas raised But come with me, it'll be alright You and me driving on a rainy What a what a great way to end that! Really beautiful, um, very very uh, warm and appealing song. So, can you give us um, the story behind the story on that? Uh, that just came out of nowhere. Like I, I was playing some chords, and they had a rolling feel to them, and I think it was a damp spring, and I just started singing, thinking about the rain, and I. I came up with a chord pattern and a melody and I just felled it in and started it's just trying to capture the feelings of being on in a car with the windshield wipers driving in the middle of nowhere yeah in the rain. so were you in the car or were you were you out of the car when you started writing this <laughs> I was uh, sitting right here at my desk oh okay yeah because because are you a, are you the writer who can can pretty much write anywhere, or is uh, or is or is, do you have favorite spots where you write? Um, I can write anywhere. Um, in my life, ideas come from anywhere and any time. Um, I drove past a sign that said Oxford Depot, New York. At the time, my daughter was over in. Uh, Gray Oxford, England for school, and that became a song, Oxford Depot Blue, on this song. And it's just sometimes like a word or phrase sticks in your in your mind, or there's a melody over here you like, and you gotta find some way to put them together. And once you have that thought of Oxford Depot Blue of being away from home, you can write it out anywhere, or tinker with it anywhere. Um, uh, there's a great story of an English writer uh, walking in Hyde Park, and someone interrupts me. And it's, interrupts him and says, I'm sorry to bother you, but you're not doing, you're just walking in the park. And he says, I'm not just walking in the park. I'm writing my book. You have to leave me alone. <laughs> you can write anywhere, but I think where inspiration comes is from is the bigger issue. And that can happen anywhere. And that song just kind of came out of nowhere. A, a gray day in New York, and the rain some chords that felt like you're going down the road. I can't, there's no. It's, yeah. It's, um, it, it is, it is true that I think we write a lot of our songs. Um, like, like to your point with that story, um, you're writing in your subconscious all the time. Cause I, I'm a collector of song titles and, um, sometimes before I even pick up an instrument, I'll, I'll sort of have a, an, you know, a moment of experience of what is this title telling me? And a whole story will form in my mind before I even pick up a pen or a guitar or sit at a piano or whatever. Uh, and lo and behold, it, it starts to shape, you know. And uh, sometimes I like to just sit and let that, let that, you know, you know, let it bleed into your consciousness and, and let it like, you just it's almost like watching a cartoon sometimes. <laughs> And watching the song come to life, and then you just go, and you don't have to breathe very hard into it to see it come to fruition. And I still think that the feeling of finishing a new song is one of the greatest feelings 
as a artist, writer, whatever, um, there's just it's still like the very first time, like the very first song I wrote. Like that never that never changes. It never gets stale, it never gets old. It's just like, wow, I just feel like I, I just hit hit one out of Yankee Stadium, you know? <laughs> oh, I search for that feeling. I'm a tinkerer. I could tinker and tinker and tinker and just have to train yourself the famous phrase, real artists ship. You have to send it away at a certain point. So yeah. I, I just have to let it be. And it's usually good. Right. So when you say you have to let it be, are you saying like when you finish the song, you just know it's done and you don't want to do any more to it? No, I do want to tinker. There's a song on the, the one song that has been tortured to with an inch of its life is uh, Don't Even Wave Goodbye on our new record. It's got like, I think, three trick passes at drums, different vocalists. I did countless guitar tracks and we kept trying it and trying it and we finally got it to where we all liked it. I could have kept tinkering. We finally just had to send it away. Yeah. But I do think you can make little improvements as you go and, and you know, all make the lyrics better or the solo sharper or just maybe get rid of some things that were just a crutch. I don't know. Are you... Are you big on the rewrite, Tom? Yes, I, I yeah. write, and write, and write, and write, and write. Uh, I'm handing Megan new lyrics every time we rehearse, and she's been really patient about it. Yeah, I think that's so important for people who, um, maybe some of the, our listeners who are, um, you know, just new to this experience. Um, I think rewriting is one of the most valuable things you can do because. I mean, when I was just starting out, I'd, I'd finish the song, go, wow, the song's done. And then, you know, I wondered why it was just not, I didn't want to keep going to it because it wasn't good enough. Right. And it, 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 I left it way too early. And now I'm like, you know, now I just, my, my method is I never try to write a whole song. I try to write a whole bunch of ideas right. and gather as many as I can. And then I do a vetting out process and say, well, you know, which one is grabbing me here? I listen to them all and say, all right, these are the five or the 10 or the 12 that I'm going to work on out of that big pile. And then it's just an endless um, rewrite session after rewrite, you know, and, and I think it, it pays off because you get better songs if you really work hard on them. I don't want to torture the children as metaphor uh, songs as children metaphors, but they need a lot of pushing. And some songs have a strong melody, but their lyrics seem kind of weak. And you just no matter what you do, it, and you just kind of go, "Oh, I wish you were better at math. Let's get you a tutor." You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so every song needs help in a different way. I, I've got a, I've got a. A, a song title that I, I got the lyrics all written. I can't find the music. It's uh, tinted with uh, tinted windows, metallic paint. You know, like it's yeah. just about a person who's hiding and behind there. Like, and I, I just haven't found the music yet. So you have to leave it until you find it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's nothing. Nothing gets ever thrown away because you never. I mean, I've I've you know fused two songs out of one. You know, into one before with. With just like you stated, I had a really good chorus, but I had I didn't have very good uh, verses for it, and I was able to take a couple. And I've done that only a few times, but it does work, so you don't have to throw things away all the time, you know. Hey, let's talk about uh, performances. Um, you guys, like I notice you you play around the city uh, often. Is um, do you guys have a favorite home for for where you play? Is there a favorite spot? Is it clubs? Is it you know? Is it you know? What what what's your favorite venue? We've been to, they're all great, Bowery, Electric, Bitter End, Rockwood. We, we love playing, something about the Bitter End, we just sound really good in. Maybe yeah. because it's a horizontal room, maybe it's the vibe of the room makes everybody, all my friends sound better there. So we, we, we're playing there this November, and uh, everybody's looking forward to it. Excellent. Can you give us the date? Yeah, it's Friday, November 16th at uh, 8.45. Oh, excellent, because I think your show will be out uh, before then. So folks, come out and support Heathcote Hill, man. That, that'd that be awesome. Um, so your lineup is, is it two guitars, bass, and drums? Is that the, the lineup of the band? It's uh, Currently, it's uh, Megan on vocals, my, our friend Mike Bishop on keys, Akeel James on bass, Tori Ritter on drums, and me on acoustic and electric guitars. And sometimes our friend uh, Greg Francis joins us on acoustic uh, for performances. That's always fun, but he won't be with us this time. 
Yeah, it's great to it's great to have the guest um, appearances. You know, that's always fun have, having somebody stop by and right. You know, yeah. especially somebody you respect. You know, and like they're playing. Yeah, but he's having a baby and has a new house, so not this time. He's not getting out of the house. I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that takes care of that, right? <laughs> you know, there goes all the guest appearances for a while. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, let's do another one here. This is called Oxford Depot Blue. Sounds good at the bitter end, especially Heathcote Hill. Right back to my interview with Tom, right after this word. Have you connected with your gratitude today? I think I have something that will help inspire you. It's the brand new release from James Kevin O'Connor. 
Gratitude, recorded on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee with producer Kim Copeland and team, is James' third full-length album in four years. Ten amazing songs, each one a different story about the emotions, journeys and experiences that you and I have lived. Songs like Dreamer, Jesus Teaches, Tango On and 51 Shades of Grey. And of course, the title track, Gratitude. Pick up the brand new CD today with amazing artwork and photography at iTunes, CD Baby and Amazon. Or simply go to jameskevinoconnor.com for your download right now. Send someone that you love a copy of Gratitude today. It might be exactly what they need in their life right now. Gratitude, the new release by James Kevin O'Connor. Oxford, Deep Hope Blue, what a great sound. Love the guitars. I don't know if it's uh, the Rhythmics or Natalie Merchant. I hear a little bit of um, just great, great rock tones in there and a really great song too. So so share with us um, the story behind that, Oxford, Deep Hope Blue. I uh, saw a sign up state New York said Oxford Depot next exit. And at the time, my daughter was uh, over at uh, going to school in Oxford for school away, and you know, college, college year abroad. And I just wrote a song about being away from home, doing what you have to do, and uh, put it down. Uh, nobody thought much of the track. We decided to play it for our last gig, and it was very powerful live, and it's like everybody kind of rediscovered that. Oh, that's the song we did a year ago. It was interesting. Yeah, good. So good. It's, it's pretty tough live. It sounds really great, and Megan just kills it live. Yeah. So tell us about Megan. Um, like, where did she come from? Was she in bands before? Um, had she always been doing... You know this kind, of, you know, working as a singer, or is this something that that was, you know, kind of new for her? Uh, Megan's always sung. Her sisters uh, sing, um, and they sing it every baptism and wedding and first communion and everything in the family. And Megan uh, and I were in a band a few years ago, and that's how we got to know each other. And it's something she does in her spare time. And uh, the last band took uh, two, three months leaves when Megan had her last two kids and uh, she's a mom and uh, she uh, uh, works in education and her husband uh, is an Annapolis grad and they live over in New Rochelle and one night a week we try and rehearse and do music. Yeah, excellent. So how many of her kids are playing yet? <laughs> uh, nobody yet. There's a guitar around the house that the girls are starting to pick up. I think Ella's, Ella's really up on music. Yeah. Excellent. Great ears. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, you know, usually one of the parents, you know, definitely the kids get it from one of the parents. Um, I noticed on some of the, uh, you know, on your new releases, you had some uh, great performances by um, violinist, keyboardist, uh, percussionist, you know, s some people who were really, really, um, you know, of, of some, you know, real credibility and some fame here. You want to sh share uh, uh, the stories behind how you got these folks in and and how how the sessions went with that. Um, at the about the halfway through the recording point, our main recording studio got booked on a giant anime project, and I had to look for some outside help to finish the record. And I was introduced to a terrific studio owner and engineer named Tim Hatfield in Brooklyn, CTS Studios. And he took these great tracks that we recorded, about three or four tracks, and he said, I think this would sound great with a keyboard part. What do you think? And I'm going, I'm homeless. I'm looking for help. I go, that sounds great. Who do you know? And he yeah. says, I'll send it to my friend, Rob Arthur, and he'll do it. Maybe he can do a neat thing for us. Rob Arthur has been touring with Peter Frampton for the last 15 years as his keyboard player and guitar player. He's an astonishing musician. Wow. And, a week, and a week later, thanks to the miracle of the internet, Rob's piece comes back, and it's the opening of uh, Some Things in Life. It just sounds great. And then Tim says, I think this song, like you do, would sound great with a violin. I'll call my friend Lorenza, who is Lorenza Pond 
who tours with Sheryl Crow and John Bon Jovi, and is just an amazingly talented violinist. And so Tim is just bringing all these great people to the party, Crispin to play the sax, or um, uh, uh, Bashiri Johnson on percussion. And so suddenly your record is crowded with all this amazing talent. It was great. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's it's really, you know, when you have people like that come in, it's just, um, and and they, you know, you can tell the excitement level, too, when somebody good comes in to play on your on your tracks and you just feel that they're into it, you know, and then you hear it and you just, you just know it's the real deal and they make such a contribution. There's nothing better than that. And it doesn't help that help, you know, hurt that they have the credibility that they have either, you know, but for, as the songwriter, you know, particularly looking for help and needing help and they come in and, you know, just, I think there's a certain politeness in, any session to say, hey, this is a nice song. Thanks for the gig. I appreciate it. But it was genuine, and that just made me feel good. It wasn't a crappy part of their day. It was something they thought was kind of cool, and that made me feel great. Right. Just talented. Let me I mean, ask you about, um, let me ask you about, you were, like you said, you were in an advertising agency for a long, long time. Right. Um, and, you know, you owned it, so I, I can only imagine the level of commitment stress hours that got put into this like any business um it, it just requires you you to give it your all um can you share with us like a, a moment in the business you're in now as you're in the music business essentially a, a parallel um are you drawing experiences and if so and i know you are but is there anything in particular that you're drawing from your past that helps contribute to what you're doing now with music. Um, it's in, it's been an interesting cycle because as a kid I was in rock bands and helping people win elections because I was the artistic type and I was just that kind of talkative writerly artist music noise person and um, that was great training for advertising because it's how to stimulate a group of or organize or be part of or contribute to or invent with a group of people who are there for very different reasons, just like the rock band. And now coming, turning to music after advertising, it's kind of come full circle. It's a lot harder because it's a labor of love. It's not a commercial enterprise. You yes. know, if, if we did our jobs well, we all were paid and had a nice career in advertising money was a currency that brought us together and that is obviously not true in music of part-time amateur people that just want to do a great job like Megan and me and Tori and Keel and Mike I mean we do it for love and it's like the ninth thing on our list after spouses and kids and jobs and taxes and right car repairs and you know everybody wants to make a record but they have to buy a gallon of milk on the way home first. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, for me particularly, because I used to be able to pick up the phone and blah, 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 make that happen. Here's a check. I can't, that's not how it works now. So I'm constantly reminding, you know, it's got to be something human and real because we want to do it, not because somebody, right. it's not for money. It's not for glory. You know, it's nice to have some songs on the radio, but it's just kind of, what did we make and how much do we love it? I think it's got to be. Yeah. Coming from advertising, Tom, what did, you know, a traditional advertising agency, uh, I'm assuming, and what do you think about the social media explosion now? And, and how has that, you know, impacted, I guess? I mean, are you guys, um, you know, I see you're on Reverb Nation Facebook and YouTube, um, but are you... Um, taking anything from your past as far as when you were doing the uh you know advertising is there any any of your your chops for lack of a better way, way to put it that you can drag into this new endeavor 
I mean, I know you just said it's it's not, you know, you're not doing it on the, like you're not getting in a van and driving around the world and, you know, all of you, because we know how that life is, you know, any, you know, if you're 18, that's fun. But I mean, that, that's, you know, that's a really tough gig. But is there anything you're bringing to that? And are you combining any social media into like this world now? The, the skills I learned in advertising help a lot. Of yeah. Get to the point. Don't waste anybody's time. Make sure you really have an idea. Try to be as clear as you can. Try to be fast. Try to be simple. Try to be unique. Try to be fun. Um, but the world has changed so much that a lot of what social media is is an inversion of advertising. Because I grew up in advertising where I'm Hi, I, here's my ad for BMW. I want you to buy my convertible. And people just watch the TV. Today, it's a, it's a conversation, and it's more like, what kind of convertible can we build for you at BMW? And then people will tell you. So, a lot of song, a lot of music, and social media is just an inversion of how to be available, how to present yourself, how to have a conversation, and how to make it a two way thing. And we're still learning how to do that. It's, it's right. hard. It's hard to speak musically. It's hard to speak social media. I don't know. Start with the music. We're trying to do the social media as well as we can. Right. But the song is most important. And speaking, how about Love Me a Little Bit More? Here we go. <laughs>
me a little bit more. Great song. You got some really great songs here. So um, tell us Thank about you. that one. Uh, Love me a little bit more. Um, any specific inspiration behind that one? Oh, that's probably just straight up to my wife, Lisa, who, you know, the only thing I want is for her to love me a little bit more. I had a feeling. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say I'm the one who always needs a hug. Yeah. So. Yeah, we we all need that, man. No matter what else else is going on in your life, you just need uh, you need that touch, you know. <laughs> so that that's that's just that. And I got a lot of grief from my friends off on, on the first record, which was a little dark, and um, they literally challenged me to write a straight up love song that was optimistic and not like, oh, it's going to be a terrible thing, and. So I was working really hard to do that, and that song is my best effort so far, the just straight up love song. Great song, great song. Hey, can you share with us um, uh, your regiment as a writer? Do you have a specific formula that you've, or not so much a formula, maybe a schedule? Are you writing all the time, or do you, you know, compartmentalize and say, I'm, I'm going to take this week and say, I'm doing these hours, or how does it work for you as a writer? Um, I've actually found that some, some of these, the mindsets are kind of different when we were getting ready to release the album and I, we were, I was redoing the website and redoing some graphics and finalizing the graphics on the record and all the, the lyric booklet and trying to get the YouTube thing organized and the reverb nation synchronized and all that stuff. I couldn't write a, a, a lyric or a song to save my life. I would pick up the guitar and I would doodle or I'd, you know, my shredding, you know, like little balloons licking things, but there was nothing original. It was all, it was like exercise. Um, so I find thinking visually, graphically squeezes out thinking lyrically, um, something about both squeeze out musical originality. So. My best musical melodic ideas come when I'm not stuck in a trying to be a social media person or a graphics person or something like that. I mean, those things are kind of dominant. So I, I, I literally try to think through. Oh, next week I got to leave some time to be graphic, and so you got to do. We'll do some song stuff later in the week and try and almost plan the different kinds of creativity. Which is kind of fun. I mean, I think that's fun. I think they're different. Ways. Are you mostly Tom with guitar in your hand when you're writing? Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I go and play it on. The, I try to go play it on the piano or play it acoustic to electric. I try to push a song around the playground to see if it will work. Because I like just, that metaphor. <laughs> it's just a lick, you know. Yeah. I, I have an idea for a song that came from this process, which is that it's really easy to lie with a guitar in your hand. You can tell anybody anything. I will love you forever. Yeah. But it's kind of crap, and when you write it down, I don't know. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, it. you're just reminding me of the story of uh, Life in the Fast Lane with Joe Walsh when he was just sitting there and he was... He was playing his warm-up lick, and and I think it was Glenn Fry said, "Hey, what what is that?" And it, and it turned into a whole song. But but he never felt it was a song. He just said, "This is what I play to warm up my hands on the guitar." Those guys were so. I mean, that's what a, I think is what a band is: is to hey, I can do something with that. Yeah, you know, Glenn Fry and Don Henley did something with that lick, but they I think were the first to say without that inspiration or that thread they didn't have a platform no I, I guess, same thing with hotel california yeah I mean, those guys are amazing yeah so, i mean just building it's like you said you take whatever whatever is available somebody throws something out and and we all interpret sound so differently like what, what it, you know what one person hears doesn't necessarily float somebody else's boat but man when you get like you said enough of the right people in the room together then it's just kind of like it. Just it, it's like I call it fractal journeys. You know, we're all fractals. You know, we're, we're you know we're just going into each other's worlds. Hey, um, listen, wrapping up. Um, you got this gig coming up in November, which is really really great. And uh, Heathcote Hill has their new album out. And can you give us again the um, uh, your website so we can send people there to help support you guys and purchase your music and find out all about the band, Tom? Our website is Heathcote Hill. 
So you can go to hill.net and sign up for our email list. You can link to all our music easily on playlists and stuff like that. Awesome. Check us out. We will have all of this in the show notes for you. And um, listen, I want to wish you guys uh, all the luck and success in the world moving forward with the band. And uh, really appreciate you coming on the Dharmic Evolution today to share your stories and your music. Thanks. I love chatting with you. I love your take on songwriting. It's great to hear your stories. I appreciate you having us on the show. Thanks, thanks. Some things in life rain all night. Oxford Depot Blue and Love Me a Little Bit More. These are the songs of Tom Nelson and Heathcote Hill. Please go over to the website, check out Heathcote Hill. That's heathcotehill.net. You won't be disappointed. Also, keep an eye on the website for where Heathcote Hill is playing. If you're in the New York area, you can check out The Bitter End, Rockwood Music Hall, Bowery Electric, and many, many more. Hey, really great news flash for you. Have you heard that Dharmic Evolution is now on Pandora? Yes, indeed. Pandora is into streaming podcasts. And we were selected about six months ago to uh, uh, participate in a beta test. So it was uh, totally... um, wrapped up couldn't talk about it but in the past few weeks um we got the green light and dharmic evolution has been selected as one of the many podcasts that pandora will be featuring so go over there you can check that out i'll be sending you guys a link to that if you're on my mailing list if you're not just go over to the website dharmicevolution.com get on our mailing list and i'll get you hooked up with pandora so you can get their streaming Also, the Dharmic Evolution Facebook community page, if you haven't gone by yet, go over there, check out the artists, the content that's on there. We put this site up for you. If you're a singer, songwriter, an author, a speaker, a thought leader, do you have a new video? Do you have a new song? A place where you're playing? Do you have a new book? Whatever it is, we will feature it there. Just put it up and people around the world will check in and see what you're up to. There are now 194 different artists around the world on the Dharmic Evolution website. Have you stopped by to check out if you are there? And if you haven't been, why haven't you been? Reach out to us. Go to dharmicevolution.com, the guest tab. Fill out your assets. Drop it in if you want to be a guest on this show. We are in the business of broadcasting your global career. Hey, that's it for me today. I'm your host for the Dharmic Evolution, James Kevin O'Connor, singer, songwriter, audio, video artist, master storyteller, and international talent agent. So until the next time when we meet again, I'll either see you on the socials or I'll see you from the stage.